happens. I'm going to try. Well, my name's Bill Kennedy, by the way. I'm going to skip the introduction from our wonderful MC just to keep going. And maybe as you're hearing my talk, talking here, you'll start coming in. I have not ever tried to give this talk on stage. I'm going to try to do something in a half an hour. I got my clock right there. It's 1.35. So that gives me to about, what, 2.05 to try to get all this thing done. I'm going to do my best because I want to be respectful for our next speaker. But as a good Irishman, everything you do has to start with a story. Right? I mean, that's just the way it is. So I'm working on my very first client project where Kubernetes is involved. Pretty excited about that, right? I'm going to start building some services and they're going to run in Kubernetes. So one of the first things I want to do is get a cluster running on my local machine and start building some software and figure out how to deploy that and, and, and start kind of learning Kubernetes. So one of the things that I do right away is I, I find a technology called Kind. And I've got a project here. It's my service project. This is the, the code base that I teach. It works in Kubernetes. We're going to leverage this a little bit today. And I've got a make file with a bunch of commands. So I'm just going to use the make file commands. But one of the first things I have to do if I'm going to do anything is bring up a Kubernetes cluster. So my make dev up will do the um, kind create. And so right now I'm just going to bring up our, our cluster. This is how I would start every day in the morning. I'd bring it down at night and start it back up. And now it's being provisioned. And down here we can get a little bit of a status. If I use my make dev status, ah, there it is. I'm going to make that a little smaller. And I can see that this cluster's coming up. I might even just kill that, clear it, and run it again. OK. So I, I kind of love kind for this. Nice and simple. I mean, you can use any tech you want on your local machine. I'm just using kind. Kind stands for Kubernetes and Docker. All right, so I got a, a cluster up and running. That's brilliant. And now what I want to do is I, I want to have my little sales API service that I've got here in the project, little sales API service. And I need to build that. I need to put it into a Docker container. And then I need to basically apply a deployment YAML to Kubernetes. And I've got all that stuff. I've got some base YAML here I'm going to play with. I've got some patches that we're going to deal with here. And I've got make commands to do that. So essentially, my next step in the morning is just to do this command. And that's going to essentially rebuild whatever I'm working on and then apply it into my little Kubernetes cluster. And you can see vaults coming up. And I got a little database coming up. And very soon, we should see the sales API, or the sales system coming up, if everything works out well. And that's kind of how I start my day, initializing the database and initializing vault, just doing a bunch of stuff that you got to kind of do up front. And then very soon, my day gets to start. And I've got a system up and running. And I can do a couple of things here. You know, in order for me to make any sort of API call in this system, I need a, a, a token. So I got a little token command that hits one of the endpoints, hits the main service endpoint in there. And then what I can do there is just say export that token into a little variable. Now I've got it. And I can even test, um, test something. I think I have like uh, make users or something. Boom, I just hit that endpoint. Everything's, everything's working. All right. And this is great. I'm coding for a while. The ops team at the client shop is managing our staging environment. Ask them to get that up early. And one day, for some crazy reason, I am looking at the staging environment Kubernetes configuration. I'm looking at the configuration. And I see something that I had no clue what it was about. They were setting something called CPU quotas, and they were setting limits and requests. I had no idea what these numbers actually meant. But the way I've been deving the whole time is without any of these sorts of settings. So let me show you something for a second here. Without any of these settings that I'm now seeing in the staging environment that I have no clue about, 
I'm going to run some load through my little service here. Just kind of configured without anything like that. This is just going to run 250 requests through that little service. And what I want to do is just sort of record what's happening here. Boom. So, I mean, this thing looks like it's performing pretty well considering where it's running. And suddenly, when I'm looking at that client shop, I notice something uh, super interesting. I'm seeing them setting limits and requests. And they're setting it to this number 250. And I do a tiny bit of reading, and the number apparently represents that my service that's running technically in production is only going to use a quarter of a core. And my brain goes, that don't seem like a lot of anything. I have no idea what that actually means. So they tell me that this is the way they do it. This is it. They don't really understand it themselves. They've just been told to use these small numbers. And so I want my local cluster and my services to run as close to what's happening out there in staging. So I go ahead and I say, OK, I'm going to run with the same numbers. So I'm going to make this change. I'm going to apply this here. And all I have to do at this point is apply that back to my to the cluster. So I'm going to do an apply. You can see it's restarting the pod with these settings there. We can even validate if those settings took place. Because in my little make file, I've got all the little commands that I can't remember myself, like describe the sales pod. We can even look at that. And sure enough, if I scroll, um, there it is right here. OK. So now I know I'm using this quarter of a core, whatever that means. And now I'm just kind of curious what happens. So I kind of do a make load. And it's taking a little bit longer. But I mean, I'm only using a quarter of a core, so I guess that's reasonable. But I'm just kind of curious what I'm looking at in my dev environment. And that just kind of finished, right? And I could see, at least in this environment here, that's uh, significantly different. But hey, I have no choice at this point, And it is what it is. And then it's bothering the hell out of me. A quarter of a core. Like, what does that even mean? So I start digging. And I start digging. And I won't give up. And I finally figure out what this thing means. And it scares the heck out of me. Now, I want to try to, as briefly as I can, share with you what I've identified this means. And then from there, let's see what happens with the rest of this code base. So to kind of speed that process up, there's really two things that we have to have a basic understanding. Semantically, I don't care about mechanics. We've got to understand what this number means, obviously. But before we can really appreciate that, I want to briefly talk about a little bit of the Go scheduler, semantics. Because I think if we understand the Go se se semantics here, and then we get back into that other number, we can kind of appreciate a little bit more of what we're seeing. So when your Go program starts, uh, one of the first things that the Go runtime is going to do, it's going to ask the machine it's running on, physical or virtual, how many cores do I have available to me? Now, one of the things that I do in my logs here is I, oh, I can't do it here because I'm already in, but let's do, I can look at the liveness endpoint. And one of the things that I do is I actually log the number of cores the Go program is saying it has available to it. And the answer here is four. And so what that means is that I'm a four-threaded Go program, which is why I've taken my diagram to look like this. Visually, in my head, this is how my Go program is starting up. Each P represents a logical processor or core that's been identified. Every M stands for machine, and that's a real live operating system thread that's processing stuff on that P. Then we've got Gs that we're creating. Every one of those requests are a G. And then you see at the bottom there, we've got what's called a local run queue. So we've got Gs getting queued up. And essentially, that G executes on that M. But it's still the job of the operating system to make sure that that M gets scheduled on some core. 
At the end of the day, I don't care how many layers of abstraction you have between your source code and the hardware. If the hardware isn't executing an instruction, nothing's getting done. So in this particular case, I'm a four-threaded Go program. I can execute four requests in parallel at the same time. OK. But I want to understand this model a tiny bit more, because if we can understand it a tiny bit more, I think we'll appreciate the other part of what I want to share. And part of that conversation has to be around understanding the two different types of workloads that your program may be doing. There are CPU-bound workloads, and there are IO-bound workloads. CPU-bound workloads are workloads that never really have to stop, not naturally. They're not going to wait on anything. They're not going to ask for a database connection. They're not going to ask for anything from the operating system. I think of CPU-bound workloads are like just raw algorithms that are running, like some sort of sorting algorithm where it's just going to do that computation. These are CPU-bound workloads. IO-bound workloads are the complete opposite. They're workloads that will ask for something from the operating system. They will want to access file systems and networks and databases and all of that. And any time you're going to ask for something from the operating system like that, you're going to just have to be put on hold. You're going to have to wait. These are two different types of workloads, and they have two different characteristics. So imagine for a second our CPU-bound workload. Let's think about we're doing some sort of sorting algorithm. And let's also imagine right now that the sorting algorithm can be run concurrently. What do I mean when I say concurrently? This is the definition, that word, for this talk. Concurrency means out of order execution. It means given a set of instructions to execute, we can execute it in any order, so long as we execute them all, and we should get the same result every single time. I even want to throw the word undefined. The order itself isn't just necessarily random, it's undefined. The algorithms can change all the time on us. That's concurrency. Parallelism in this talk means that we've got at least two physical cores and we can execute two threads, OS or our application level thread go routines, literally at the same time. There is no parallelism if we only have one core, but we can always have concurrency. Concurrency would essentially mean that these Go routines are taking turns, even if we were just a single core, a single threaded Go program, these Go routines are taking turns executing their workload, leveraging this M, and I have no idea what the order is going to be, and that's fine. If you don't have a workload that can be done out of order, you can't use concurrency. Now, I've already told you we have a sorting algorithm that can be done concurrently. CPU-bound workload. So let me ask you a question. Imagine that we are just a single threaded Go program. We're a single core. This is all we have. This is what we have available to us. So what about the other three? If I have a CPU-bound workload and I throw three Go routines at it, is that going to run faster if I just throw one Go routine at it? Well, part of understanding that question has to it, it, it semantically understand that what's happening here when a Go routine comes off this M and another one comes on, that's a context switch. In fact, the same thing happens at the operating system level. If this core has an M and then the operating system chooses to take that, that M off and put another M on, there's a context switch. Now, if we can be very conservative in Linux, the average amount of time it takes for a context switch at the operating system level is about one microsecond or about 1,000 nanoseconds. Now, if I had time, I'd give you a little formula that would prove to you that every nanosecond of time equals about 12 instructions, which means I want you to think about latency in a whole other way. Stop thinking about latency and time because we can't even comprehend that, but we can think about latency in terms of instructions. So if every nanosecond that goes by that we don't do anything, that's 12 instructions you didn't execute that you otherwise could. There it is. What about a microsecond of time? What does that cost? That costs you 12,000 instructions. That's a, you could do a lot of work in 12,000 instructions. Don't even get me started at a millisecond because then we're talking about 12 million instructions. We could do a lot of work in one millisecond if we didn't lose it. So I just told you that's 1,000 nanoseconds. That's 12,000 instructions lost. Every time the operating system gets involved and pulls that M off the core and puts another one on, there's 12,000 instructions we didn't lose, that we did lose, sorry. Now, at the Go level, the last time I looked and it was measured, that was about 200 
nanoseconds or 2.4 instructions lost. So my first question is, where would you like the context switch to take place? The operating system level at 12,000 instructions lost or at the Go level at 2.4? I think we know the answer to that. Let's get back to my question now. We've got a CPU bound workload. We can do it concurrently. I choose to run it with one Go routine and then I choose to run it with three. Technically, which one is going to run faster on our single threaded Go program? Well, the one with the one Go routine. Why? Because at some point, the schedule is going to want to context switch that G. It's going to do its 10 milliseconds of time. It's going to swap it out. And every time it swaps it out, what happens? We have to spend instruction time doing the context switch instead of doing sorting. So the bottom line here, if we had more time, I'd go deeper. But the bottom line is when we have a CPU bound problem, we don't want to use more threads, application or OS, then we have cores. Because context switches are slowing us down, they're getting in our way. Now let's go back to an I.O. bound problem. I.O. bound problems are different. Because even though that Go routine has a 10, second, a 10 millisecond time slice, it's probably going to use a millisecond or less before it goes to make that database call. And the moment it makes that database call, it no longer needs to hold that hem hostage. If anything, the context switch is our friend, because we're going to pull that G off, we're going to put the next G on, and we're going to keep going. When it comes to an I.O. bound workload, context switches are our friend. We love them. It allows us to leverage that core and that thread with a lot of work. We love I.O. bound workloads. But they're not as easy to reason about. How many Go routines gives us the most amount of efficiency? It's almost an impossible thing to calculate. Why? Because none of our workloads are static or constant. One of the beautiful things about Go is it lets us just throw hundreds of thousands of Go routines at a problem, and it deals with that. At the operating system level, you could never do that. You couldn't throw that many threads at the scheduler because the whole thing would just come to a halt. But not with Go. Now, why is that anyway? Well, what I want to try to share with you right here is one of the beautiful things about this scheduler, one of the things that makes this scheduler so amazing is that it converts I.O. bound workloads, which is the majority of the work that we do, by the way. I don't think I've ever really worked on a CPU bound problem in my life. It converts I.O. bound workloads into CPU bound workloads at the operating system. From the operating system's point of view, your Go programs are doing CPU bound work. How amazing is that? which is why we don't need more threads than we have cores, because if you're doing CPU-bound work, you don't want more threads than you have cores. <sighs> it's beautiful. OK, we've got that laid out. Remember that. Let's talk about the next piece. What does this mean, a quarter of a core? Well, it basically comes down to this. Kubernetes working in conjunction with your operating system will, for every core, we can look at it this way. We're looking at the semantics here. So for every core that we have, what we're going to do is we're going to create a 100 millisecond cycle. Can you see that? Good. And we're going to do this 100 millisecond cycle over and over and over again. And now the fun begins. If we tell Kubernetes that we want an entire core to ourselves, what we're telling Kubernetes is I want the full 100 milliseconds of every 100 milliseconds to myself. I want that. Give it to me. Now, if I say I want a half a core, then what am I saying? I'm saying I want half of that. I want 50 milliseconds of every 100 milliseconds every unit of time. That's what I want. If I say a quarter of a core, which is what I saw on the other system, I'm only getting 25 milliseconds. Now, don't start panicking. I already told you, in one millisecond, we could execute 12 million instructions. And the reality is, is we're doing I.O. bound work anyway. So we're probably spending more time waiting than we are anything else. So really, 25 milliseconds can be a lot of time. Could be a lot of time. OK, so let's put sort of all of this together. 
right now, I am running as a four-threaded Go program with a limit of a quarter of a core. Huh. One thing I didn't tell you, that time, the 25 milliseconds of every hundred, that's the sum of all threads, all operating system threads that are running in your system. So I have four operating system threads running right now at the same time. And what are they doing? They're eating up that 25 milliseconds almost immediately. Thank God I only have four. I mean, if I had eight, how much faster would that 25 milliseconds get eaten up? The way I visualize it, it's almost like a race, but there's four people in the race. And here's the reality at a quarter of a core. We all get to take one step, and then we have to wait. Then we all take another step, and we have to wait. We take another step, and then we take one more step, and we finally got four things done. But how long did it take? Hmm. Ideally, if I'm only going to get a quarter of a core, then how many threads really should I be running on? Ideally, I should only be running on one thread. If I'm only getting a quarter of a core, it means I'm only really leveraging one core. And if I'm only using one core doing CPU bound work, how many threads should I be using? Let's do the math. And if I only use the one thread, now what's happening? I'm taking four steps. I'm getting four things done faster than I was getting things done with the four. Why? Because of all the mechanics that we just share, all the semantics. Now, how can I prove that? I just ran this workload with a quarter of a core, and you saw this, but remember, my threads were four. If I can make the threads one, if what I'm saying to you is true, then if I can get this Go program to run as a single threaded Go program and a quarter of a core, that performance should go up at some level. Should go up. Okay, let's see that. How can I do that? Well, this is the cool part. I can come in here. What I can say is, you know what, Kubernetes? I want you to read the limit number, and I want you to use that to set go max prox. Now, the cool part is, is that when it says 250M, it really means 0.25, which you could have put in there too. I just like the M. And then thanks to a little Kubernetes magic, it takes that 0.25 and it uses a math.ceiling function and it, up, it uh, rounds it up to one. So it's going to set that to one, which means my Go program should be a single-threaded Go program. When I'm done, I'm going to save that. I'm going to apply it back to my cluster. Let's go make live. Let's run our live. Oh, there it is. We're not running as a single-threaded Go program. Now, this is the moment of truth. If this isn't faster, you can just throw gophers at me. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Finish now. Oh, that already felt faster, didn't it? Yeah, I think it was faster. Let's take a look. Yep, we almost doubled on this. And this is a small load. This is like super tiny. And when things are this tiny and you see that sort of a significant performance increase, imagine. So now what do I have to do? Now that I know in staging and production they're going to run as a quarter of core, I've got to make sure that my ops team is doing what? They're setting those limits. Or they're setting the go max proc value based on the limits so we can run as efficiently as possible. There it is. That's what's going on. You don't have to remember anything else I said other than if you're setting limits, you better only be using the same number of threads that you're using cores, at least in this environment, if you want to run as efficiently as you otherwise could. And guess what? I stayed under 30 minutes. Yeah. It's okay. I don't need it. We're going to take that break. Everybody's going to get a five-minute break before the next talk. <laughs> Thank you, Boo.